How's everybody? My name is Eric, and today we're going to be taking a look at this malware analysis advent of cyber challenge provided by TryHackMe. Now, this is going to be a fun way to get into get started with malware analysis because a lot of people comment like, "How how can I get started?" Well, I've talked about TryHackMe before, and we've had some fun playing challenges, so we're going to play this challenge. So, what is TryHackMe? For those of you who don't know, TryHackMe is an interactive cloud-based educational cybersecurity platform with over 6 million users. I like it because it's interactive. You're not just reading lectures or taking a video course, where honestly you are never going to, you, you learn some things, but you're never going to become proficient in something like cybersecurity from just watching videos. You need to experience it. And what we've got here, uh, we've got everything we need. So we're going to start up the attack box, but first of all, let's figure out what we're going to do. Now, I'm going to play this blind so that you can see what it's actually like. I haven't I haven't done research. This is going to be a bit like a let's play. So in our kingdom, Wareville, just like in others, thousands of files pass through the systems every day from docx, PDF, resumes received by our elves, to financial spreadsheets, CSVs from the accounting department, and executable files launched by different applications. But have you ever wondered which of these might be malicious? Which ones could actually belong to King Malhair? An interesting question, isn't it? In this task, the TBFC SOC team will investigate one specific file type, the HTA format. Type often used, is it used for legit? Probably historically it was, but very frequently exploited. So we're going to reverse engineer it and figure out what's wrong. So we're going to look at application metadata, script functions, network calls, and clues about exfiltration. So HTA, if you've watched any of my videos about ClickFix, you've probably seen this. It's essentially, it, Microsoft in the 2000s was really on a bend of creating proprietary variants of popular formats, and HTA was one. It was supposed to be a more powerful version of HTML that came with the ability to include JScript and VBScript along with other types of code and Microsoft's infamous active. So let's review the questions. Do I need to start the attack box? Yes. Do I need a VM? Nope. Nope, nope. So we're just going to work through the attack box. And then we can open the sample using this. So don't run it locally. All right. So we're going to start the attack box and acknowledge. Yep. I believe that's just they've added a new region. And of course, because I'm in North America, I will get better latency to North America than I will to England. Now, if you're in Europe, uh, Europe might be better, so they're, they're now auto-detecting that. We're using Pluma. Now, I actually haven't used that tool before, so what is, is it Pluma or Pluma? Oh, it's a text editor, okay. Probably going to, probably uh, an XFCE text editor, if I'm guessing, because the attack box uses called a Linux. So we just got to remember this video, I'll just repeat roughly the idea of the disclaimer is purely for educational purposes to help you learn to set defensive cybersecurity, protect against threats, and learn employable skills. Not to commit any sort of criminal acts, and that's what that disclaimer is for. So now let's open this up in Pluma, which is, I was right, it's an XFCE text editor. So we can see this looks like a pretty normal HTML at first. So it's a survey uh, for best festive company. We can just check that. Now, here is the questions that we're going to have to answer. Now, whenever you go into any reverse engineering or analysis, it's always a good idea to know what you're hoping to get out of it. It's very hard, like, with anything that isn't just like a C sharp app, reverse engineering is going to be quite an involved process. So you want to figure out, okay, what are we looking to find out? And, like, are we looking to find an indicator of compromise? Are we dealing... Like, maybe our concern is we ran this and we want to see how does the persistency work. So here we're going to go through and see what are our goals to learn here. So not long ago in the summer of 2025, researchers discovered that ransomware groups were using HDA files disguised as fake verification pages to spread the Epsilon Red ransomware. During that campaign, many organizations were affected, and security teams were reminded how important it is to understand what HTA files are and why they appear so often in corporate environments. So what exactly are they? Why do they exist? In Wareville's digital kingdom, not every strange-looking file is a threat. Some were created to make the daily work of developers and administrators easier. So it's a HTML application. It's a small desktop app built using familiar web technologies. Uh, not unlike in the modern era, you know, we have Electron. 
Uh, but unlike a web page, it runs directly on Windows through Microsoft HTML Application Host. This allows them to look and behave like lightweight programs with their own interfaces and actions, legitimate use cases for them. So uh, first of all, we have the declaration, which you can see on the real file here, the interface. This is the GUI, which is written in HTML, just like a website, and the script. Now this is where things can get a bit hairy. Uh, so this one's legitimate. Yes, that's the problem. So how King Malhair turns HTAs into weapons. So they're often delivered, yes, and run by this. Download with droppers, so sometimes it will just download more malware. It can be obfuscated using Base64, yes, and oftentimes it will run these. So because you're not adding more binaries, it may be harder for some uh, EDRs to detect. That'll make sense to me. So let's try this out. So this is malicious. So what we can see here is we've got PowerShell, and then we've got, okay, I'm just going to go to base64 decode. What? I, I don't know. I don't care. You can have all my data. And we can see, okay, uh, this is actually going to kingmalhair.com and downloading malware. But really, just seeing the Base64 is probably enough to know there is no legitimate reason uh, for Base64 to be in a survey script. And they're going to use CyberChef, which is great. Another tool. And there we go. Yeah, and you always got to be sure you don't execute it. Luckily, if we're on Linux, that, that should be okay. So I'm actually just going to... Is this how we do that? Okay, well, that works. Yeah, we're just going to move this into a separate room so that we can get a full view so you can see it easier. So here we go. So we can, first of all, we can see JavaScript. This all looks perfectly legitimate. But then we have VBScript. Okay, that looks normal enough to me. Although, okay, so we go here. Oh. So this doesn't quite... Uh, I, I don't think this is what it seems to be. No, we can see if we can... Not sure if this is going to be a real domain or not. So get questions provide feedback. So what we can see as well is the functions here are all named to look like something else. Now that, that does definitely happen in real world malware. When you have a scenario where it is impossible, like if it's uh, something like a HDA file where it's impossible to fully hide the source code, they'll try and make it look legit. So computer name, username is being sent off. I don't like that at all. So we can see uh, Internet Explorer application that's being created, and that's going to send our basic computer information off to there. And where's feedback string coming from? Oh, it's it's being passed. Okay, and then uh, a PowerShell command is going to be executed. I don't like that either. And then here we've got a base64 decode. Now, and I've said this before, but it it really doubles. It's really helpful to have some amount of programming experience before you get into reverse engineering and malware analysis. You don't have to, like, I would not be comfortable programming in VBScript, but just having programming understanding, you can pretty quickly understand what these are doing, like an if statement. There's a lot of commonality between different programming languages. We can see, all right, so there's, if the variable, variable type of this is eight. Now this I might have to Google, but and see, okay, sometimes you can just keep reading and you figure out what's going on here. And then this is just the style. So everything outside of this script, I'm going to guess is legitimate. Yep, this all looks normal. And that, that is base64, but that's a legitimate use of it. So all of the malware is downloaded through this section. So now we can fill out the questions, much like how you might write a report. So what is the title of the application? Well, we can find that up at the top. So let's see. What is the title? It's Festival Elf Survey. Festival... Hmm, that doesn't look right. No, we want the HTML type. Best Festival. That makes more sense. So this is the one we want. But VBScript function is... So let's see. Now, something else we can tell when we think about this being sneaky is the functions are actually already there. Now, what URL is this being downloaded from? Hmm. 
Oh. Oh, okay, so we just got to get rid of the... And there we go, that's just a formatting issue. And that one's now right. Which character gives this away? The eye. Because you can see... Um, it's a common red flag in malware. You can see, okay, I see two eyes here. I don't really like that. How many questions does the survey have? Let's see. One, two, three, four. Four, four questions. And there's apparently a free trip to somewhere. The South Pole. <laughs> That's actually funny. Of course, it's because this is right. This is the North Pole. So they're going to get to see the South Pole. And then we got to see, okay, which... What's actually being exfiltrated here? Computer name and username. And there we go. What endpoint is the data being exfiltrated to? Details. What they mean specifically is, so we have the C2 domain here, and then after that we have an endpoint, which is the slash details. Because best festival company is the C2 domain, and then details is the endpoint. It's using the get method, which is atypical, but that may be a method of trying to uh, escape. Uh, but you can tell that by looking, it's navigating to, it's not posting. So it just looks like a normal web browser. Oh, have to type out the line of code, not the line number. That's why it's a bit longer. So we're just going to do that. Run object dot run. Okay, and now here's an archive of the data that was actually going to be downloaded. So what popular encoding scheme is used? Well, you can tell. Um, once you've been doing this for a while, you get pretty used to identifying base64, one giveaway, although it's not present here, is the equal sign. Uh, if you see a bunch of equal sign padding, that's probably base64, but we can see just looking at these letters, the randomish capitalization, that this only makes sense as base64. I'm actually going to submit that, and then I'll check. Decode the payload. Seems as if additional steps were used. We can see, okay. Now this is common, so we got a character array. So first of all, this is going to take the input, and which is this, and it will uh, turn that into a integer. So it takes the character number. Okay, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm gonna guess that's greater than an equal to and less than an equal to. Not a big PowerShell fan. Uh, so we can see, okay. So that's going to be, if you think about the ASCII characters, so that, uh, if it's uh, greater than or equal to 65, and less than or equal to 90, that's simply checking if it's an uppercase, and then this is checking if it's a lowercase. And then it's shifting by 13, so the answer is a rot 13. Another way we can tell, right, so this is, first of all, uh, so we take the... Once you subtract this, right, you've now got the character's position in the alphabet. So, suppose we had a capital A, we take 97 off, and we've now got 0. So then we add the 13, and then the mod here, which is... If you remember in, in school, when you learn division, you learn about remainders. Computers normally don't have remainders, but this takes the remainder. So if we've gone over 26, we just roll over. So if, let's say, we had x plus 2, we're now back to a. And then we add this so that it retains its casing. So that just will make the whole thing even more tricky to understand. Now, luckily, CyberChef can handle the rot13 just fine. So you can then rot13 that back, and now you get the flag, which is thm, malware.analyze. And we get the correct answer! Of course we did. Oh, I forgot to check the Rot13, that was also the correct. So now we've completed the challenge. Uh, yeah, it was fairly easy, but it was a good intro into some of the things you'll do. And if you've ever watched any of my videos, 
uh, where I do malware analysis, you'll see that a lot of this does consist of kind of exploring, uh, guessing, and the more you do this, the more you'll learn these things. You know, I, I don't really recommend like going through and studying every type of encoding, just as you do more malware, you're going to notice signs. Another way you can tell, right, and we'll use the ROT13 again, just so you can get an idea. Do you see something uh, that has the right casing, spacing makes sense, but otherwise just doesn't look quite right? That's probably going to be a ROT13 or some sort of ROT. Now, you can easily step through these until you see something coherent. So this is going to be a relatively easy uh, one to beat. So that's going to be all for this video. Thank you to TryHackMe for sponsoring this. I really like it. I think it's a really fun, interactive way to get started. And there's also a lot more complicated stuff on here. And please let me know in the comments below if you want to see more content like this. Do you want to see some of the harder challenges? We could, we could make a whole series. We could do some of the trickier ones. I have links in the description uh, to get started with my link and get a special discount if you decide to sign up with a premium plan. But don't worry, you can also just get started completely for free. Uh, try it out, see if it's something you like, and hopefully avoid falling for any sketchy surveys. So that's going to be all for me for now. Bye.